you know, I'm going to start today with a, a very light concept, right? <laughs> that that infrastructure is the platform upon which civilization is built. And what and where and who we invest in says everything about what we value. So if infrastructure investment is a reflection of our values, the question becomes, what value should be expressed in how we invest? And I'm gonna to propose to you how I look at it. Uh, but you know, this is a conversation and I would like, you know, the ensuing conversations to really explore this or, you know, uh, uh, pose other, other ideas. Infrastructure should equitably and sustainably support community health and wealth. For me, that's a simple way of synopsizing what I think our goal as, a, as infrastructure creators and managers should be. Um, I'd like to know what you think of when you consider infrastructure as well and equitably and sustainably supporting community health and wealth. We can talk about that later, um, but uh, since this is just a single talk by me for right now, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about what I think about that. Um, for me, there is an urgency and gravity that puts per that uh, to that purpose um, that really puts a finer point on our mission. You know, whether or not we develop infrastructure that will truly sustain us in the long run, or not is central to the nature and quality of our survival. Uh, we're in a moment when it's crucial to make a safe and effective transition to more distributed and integrated forms of infrastructure and to even expand our understanding of what constitutes infrastructure. And I'm sure you've heard a little bit about that in the national dialogue uh, and you know we'll be exploring that. Um, now and in the coming decades, our communities will save, will, sorry, will face many severe environmental and affordability challenges. You know a lot of these challenges from the headlines. Severe drought, snowpack loss, seismic risk, and water shortages in the West. Coastal flooding in the South, lead and riparian flooding in the Midwest and other parts of the US, extreme storm events in Texas that have brought flooding, frozen pipes, and serious system failures. Uh, and across the country, there are areas that have lack of access to reliable and clean water for people and fish. And globally, sea life populations are diminishing at startling rates, in part due to chemical and plastics pollution. We can't ignore these problems and we can't push them off to future generations. So our country must make investments that will address our aging water infrastructure. And in doing so, address environmental health impacts and foster resilience to climate change. And utilities like ours have to be effective agents in advancing those responsibilities. Uh, for a little context uh, background before we talk about you know, the future, uh, most big investments in urban infrastructure happened a long time ago and were often developed as a means of political expansion or in response to crises, such as great urban conflagrations or the need to house people in the post-World War II population boom and the need to get people to that housing. For example, the last huge national push in wastewater investments were made almost 40 to 50 years ago in response to the passage of the Clean Water Act, which was itself a response to a national water quality crisis. And these investments created the most prevalent types of infrastructure, the, 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 the investments of the past um, that our cities still rely on today. But uh, largely at the time that um, big infrastructure was created, infrastructure design was dominated by concepts of centralization and efficiency. Unfortunately, using efficiency as the leading design principle for infrastructure. I mean, not, it should be, it can be part of many principles, but as the leading one, um, though understandable in a context of crisis is essentially an antisocial 
and ultimately wasteful and inefficient approach and has led to many social breakdowns and economic issues. And I'm going to just give you an example. The expansion of the highway systems included prioritizing the theoretical efficiency of cars going in and out of urban centers and cutting through cities and destroy and ultimately destroyed many communities. The modes of transportation that worked well within cities, such as walking, streetcars, bicycling, etc., were often marginalized, eliminated, or rendered unsafe. All the while, ever-growing highway systems became more and more congested and untenable. Over the past decade in particular, communities have risen up across the country to demand that the dominant approach to transportation infrastructure change towards a more complete and green streets approach that benefits all users and the environment. So energy waste management and water as sectors have opportunities for similar transitions. Many water utilities continue to follow the efficiency paradigm and to invest big money in single purpose solutions that accrete as regulation accretes. And though frankly, money spent on single purpose infrastructure, infrastructure often ends up buried in a big black box or a levy, out of sight, out of mind, out of connection to community opportunities and ever more costly. So, but even though that infrastructure isn't what we would have built at this point in time, we still need it to work. We need it to be as reliable and affordable as possible as we connect it to more sustainable community supporting approaches. And that means that we'll need to do something really miraculous. We'll need to double the impact of our investments. We will need to make investments, we'll need to spend money, but we also need to figure out how to make the most of every dollar that we spend. We need to do that to sustain the old and the new and to get us safely to a sustainable retooled future. Uh, you know, and this is in response to all of the different kinds of challenges that I, I mentioned. So one water and zero waste tools such as green stormwater infrastructure, distributed wastewater treatment, renewables, or renewable energy, uh, micro hydro, which you may have never heard about, or gasified biochar, which you also may have never heard of, um, floodplain and ecosystem restoration and extended producer responsibility signal the beginning of the transition to an integrated way of thinking away from centralization and efficiency as dominant principles in infrastructure development. We at Seattle Public Utilities and, and other uh, uh, utilities are realizing the huge opportunities to create more social and environmental value for each infrastructure related dollar that is spent. Um, and I'll just give you an example of some of our work. Um, our own constructed green stormwater infrastructure is managing pollutants from 400 million gallons of stormwater annually. Our green stormwater infrastructure system is a decentralized network of bioswales, ponds, creeks, rainwater cisterns, street trees, and other plants that improve mental and physical health, the quality and even quantity of life, uh, volunteerism, community cohesion, habitat, and even place. And those 400 million gallons of management by constructed green stormwater infrastructure don't even account for the vast ecosystem services provided by our existing infrastructure. And this is where we start to think about what is infrastructure differently. Our vast existing infrastructures of fields, forests, lakes, streams, and the sound. Um, you know, it's, it's the, you know, to me, this is all infrastructure. Uh, even realizing activities or costs that were previously abhorred like maintenance, can be acceptable within a holistic decision-making model. Maintaining green and living systems is not the worst thing in the world because the benefits are worth it, such as improved air and water quality and quality of life, training opportunities and low barrier family supporting jobs. Um, I'd also like to make a pitch for something that is sometimes 
often ignored. Um, I'd like to make a pitch that the reduction of pollutants in industry should be a key component of nature-based or at least nature-honoring approaches. Water managers and waste managers have long understood that they are responsible or made responsible for the negative externalities, which are the environmental impacts and costs that accrue downstream of polluting production and consumption, and that ratepayers and communities, not industry, pay for these costs. Uh, let me cite just one example of the enormous impacts related to just one product. Um, you know, I could go on forever about PCBs and its network of health and economic impacts, but I'll focus on a lesser known chemical, 6-PPD, which is used to help preserve tires. As tires wear down and 6-PPD runs off roads with stormwater and enters waterways and kills off salmon, like <laughs> really effectively which in turn deprives people and larger species which have cohabited and thrived off the salmon for millennia. Sufficiently reducing 6-PPD in water bodies through post-exposure environmental management measures alone would be vastly expensive, if not impossible. And yet, until there's a ban on 6-PPD, infrastructure managers have to strive for feasible management approaches at great cost and contention. So, uh, you know, I feel like we are really in this around producer responsibility if we're going to be responsible water managers. Uh, I'll give you another example of the importance of nature-based and nature-honoring approaches. And this is kind of a writ large issue is the need to expand what we consider to be infrastructure. And it's the, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's the need, it's the issue of flooding. Um, we're seeing floods at a staggering scale, frequency and cost. And while there is no one approach that fits all situations, few levees can rival the multi-benefit flood absorbing performance of wetlands or the dynamic protections provided by dunes. And like the producer responsibility issue around 6PPD, Production and consumption activities that in turn produce carbon emissions drive climate impacts like flooding. So in this brief illustration, nature-based solutions like wetlands and nature honoring approaches like emissions reductions or renewable energy can work in concert for higher performance and lower cost. Our work is part of an interconnected web of decisions that we all make. Um, so we'll have to work together with a wide range of folks, uh, an extensive number and range of folks to figure out how to get there as extensively as we can. Uh, the, because you know, part of it is that the management of water is intimately tied to our ways of life. When our practices change, so does our way of life. Even where and how we live, when, you know, just think with a, with a growing scarcity of water, where people live changes. Um, so integrating one water investments with our existing infrastructures and trans transitioning to one water and zero waste approaches, which I realize now that I have not defined for you but that we can, we can get to later, um, approaches that are often more inclusive, more distributed, more community-based and community-serving, more intelligent and more visible has a dynamic relationship with people's needs and expectations. And this is an important issue, cultivating the capacity uh, and the support for one water investments, for holistic, integrated water investment that serves community at a significant enough scale to make real, uh, you know, a real difference that we can see uh, will require that our web of influence grows beyond uh, where it is now and grows enough to influence people's tastes, their expectations, their desires, and ability to be part of those investments. And, you know, on our utility side, we have to expand our sense of ourselves as more than infrastructure managers. We have to see ourselves as people connectors so that we don't miss the opportunities that were overlooked in the last generation of infrastructure investment. And so that we're able to maximize the impact of every dollar that we can influence through integrating and aligning with others. This is the time 
to make the most of any possible resources and partnerships locally and nationally. And that means fostering deep and lasting investment in water and intersecting needs as our many speakers have highlighted to us. And, you know, and, and if we can do that, that will help to advance global survival and sustainability. Um, it also means advancing the management of water and materials as an art. Uh, and, and, you know, I really have a lot of faith in that kind of art, you know, because I look at that, this, this watershed and it represents that art of, you know, an art that can sing about culture, place, environmental processes, what people value uh, across generations and at every scale of our work. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to all of you about these ideas.